Okay, so Walt Disney Company and its precise clustering approach. Um, I want to I want to point out a, a, a sort of like quick line on one ninety one ninety two. This idea of the call to action. I think this is kind of an important idea. So uh, this is from one ninety one to one ninety two. That last kind of um, partial paragraph. This tightly integrated channel portfolio is demographically segmented with a channel for each of the following. So the channel portfolio, right? Toddlers, how many is it? One, two, three, four, five, six. So. <coughs> that was pretty good. Anyways, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Um, toddlers, kids, tweens, teens, young adults, and adults. The progression of demographic Targets. Again, audiences target. And custom promotional content of offered on each channel almost guarantees that a new film will reach the precise range of viewers that might be called to action to see the film in theaters upon its release. What is he saying? Or what is she saying, rather? So you go from here to here, right? Everyone, everyone is targeted. No one gets outside of the pie, right? Because think about it. They're not talking in terms of gender. They're not talking in terms of race. They're not even talking in terms of nationality. They are talking in terms of age. And that is a marker or an identity marker that includes all of us, right? None of us are excluded. Disney wants the whole pie. So you go from toddlers to adults, and then you have these sort of gradations. So it's like this age to this age, this age to this age. I mean, you look, it says, right? Like there are guidelines, right? And what it means is, is that like from this, this, like let's say this individual's lifetime from here to here, right? And there are certainly generations in, like right now who fit this that have been in the system from toddler to adult that they can answer the call to action, where let's say at any given point, right, when they're a toddler, you know, a film comes out. Then a child, film. A few years later, film. So six films, right? And Disney calls, like, puts out the call to arms. Like, and then this single individual will answer the call every time. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? It's a call to action. It's getting you in the system. Every time they're like, hey, it's time to show your support. I'm at the right age to go to the right film that's been designed for me. And at the same time, do you think that they're only following the trajectory of this person? No. While there's a film out for a toddler, it's like they're staggered. There's a film out for this demographic, this demographic, this demographic, this demographic, and this demographic. And, and ultimately, no one gets away. That's why we're targets, right? This is the tight in in integration, right? So on 192, continuing, that's what that's one of the like in, in the Disney model. So it's like it's not in the in the according to Gillen in the NBC Universal model, it's not like Tina Fey or um, Amy Poehler are out there shilling for their other like you know content. So it's like you know they're not out there on on Thirty Rock doing commercials for Baby Mama. Um, uh, uh, that sort of thing, but but what 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 Gillen is pointing out is that Disney it's so tightly structured that they are right that they do have these personnel actually kind of selling the other stuff, um, uh, and and you know again like it, it's diverse the portfolio is diverse enough that it's a, a, across Walt Disney, Pixar, Lucasfilms, Marvel, and also now Fox right. Um, on one ninety three she talks about Zendaya, right who who. Me personally, I only knew her because I've, I've, I'm only I'm only in this demographic now. I didn't I didn't I only knew her because of the Spider-Man films, but I think it's really genius. Um, and, and Gillen points this out that no, like she's been in this system this entire time, right? So she gets to simultaneously, right, kind of market to all of these demographics, right? Um, but I do I do want you to kind of point or, or look at that, right? So 193 to 194 um, from 
Let's see. She was on Dancing with the Stars, Casey Undercover, Shake It Up, Radio Disney. Um, so basically from like 2010 to 2017 for seven years, Zendaya has been a Disney star. Probably not a coincidence that they, that they um, cast her for, for, for Spider-Man, right? Um, on 194, I do want to point out the kind of blurring of content and promotion. So this is at the very bottom. I think this is really important. Um, so, uh, um, oh, what's the, what's the term? Uh, it's, it, I'm totally blanking on it. But you know when they advertise um, things in films diegetically, that's something that we, we're, we're now kind of uh, sort of um, self-conscious of or, or conscious of, you know, and, then, and we, we kind of respond poorly to. But, but I think what Gillen does is get us to think about other ways in which promotion has occurred where it seems so much germane or natural that, you know, like, because I think we as Americans are kind of usually sort of critical of promotion and marketing. But there are other, what she's pointing out in some senses, I think, are other ways that it goes under the radar or we don't mind it as much. And part of that is to make it seem like, well, it's just part of the content. And that's what those kind of uh, the, the ads that were, uh, the, the, the promotions that were part of the narrative um, uh, kind of did. This kind of interstitial blurs the lines between content and promotion, between actor and character, between character and creator, between PR and personal commentary, and it moves the output of the studio away from economic production and toward a mode of personal expression. So when you have Anthony Anderson, who's kind of, you know, invoking, it's not like he's staying in character from his character from Blackish, but he's certainly invoking that character and talking about Black Panther in a personal way, about how it's personally important. And that's probably true, right? But it's blurring that line. It's not like, and again, it goes back to the affective attachment. If I, if, for example, if I worked for Lucasfilms, which I don't, because um, I'd be making much more money, and I talked about how important personally Star Wars is to me, that can come off as a very genuine and real kind of personal story and an and emotional experience, but it is at the end of the day still promotion, right? But that's one of the ways that they're getting away with it, right, today, in, in our kind of um, um, uh, 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 day and age. Now the next thing that I really want to kind of point out also is the is this sort of notion of interpretations. And you know, a lot of people um, tend to kind of think of certain things as propaganda and other things not as propaganda. Um, uh, so it's like, and usually we only use it as a kind of like, pejorative term. So it's propaganda if it's something that I don't like, right? It's like North Korea produces propaganda, but we, we here, we don't do that. You know, there's no, we have no ideology. So specifically, like, the idea of multiple interpretations is what I want to point out, but a kind of official interpretation as opposed to an unofficial. And oftentimes, this is why I kind of, like, if you're doing media studies correctly, you know that there's no such thing as a totally wrong interpretation and, and more importantly like a totally right or like the right interpretation but what Gillen is pointing out is that there is a kind of narrative or, or a preferred kind of company conglomerate corporate interpretation um, so on 195 this is like uh, um, uh, when she's talking about the audio uh, animated short with Blackish first few lines Robert Allen Brookie and Robert uh, Wester Fellhouse, known as the two Roberts, claim that audio commentary, so like on when you like, you know, like on DVDs, right? Or even just like, you know, when, when, the, when the producers come out, can direct the viewer toward preferred interpretations of the primary text while undermining unfavorable un un interpretations. So preferred versus unfavorable. So if you have someone who's in the Disney system, 
right? So if you have the, in, in this case, the cast of blackish on like um, uh, 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 something produced by Disney talking about Black Panther, they're also directing the way that, we're, that we should be reading the film, right? That this is the interpretation, that this is the correct analysis. And, and that, that in and of itself, I mean, is already kind of, you know, it's not so great, but the, the bigger problem is, is that it then kind of draws a line and says that these other readings are, are just wrong, right? And like, to me, you know, like, like, it doesn't sound very democratic, does it? Where it's like, you know, this idea that there's only one way to read it, and the way, like, it, the way that to read it, it comes from, like, you know, the corporate office. Wrapped up, right? Wrapped up in, in this kind of personal or, like, affective dimension, right? Um, so it's just something to think about, right? And, and, and we're going to talk uh, a few pages later about, like, about this a little bit further. Um, but on 198, just another term that comes up, the idea of taste cluster appeals, right? So another way um, that, that, you know, content is clustered. They talk specifically about, like, Kendrick, the Kendrick Lamar soundtrack with Black Panther. But so because you watch this, there's another sort of interpolate kind of um, dimension to it where it's like it's configuring you as a person you again which goes back to what I was trying to like really poorly explain earlier you watch this you might like this you might be sophisticated again like she points out that NBC Universal's self-brand of comedy is smart comedy so that's how they get you right it's like oh you watch Parks and Recreation well you must be smart smarter than those people that watch you know Big Bang Theory or um, or, or, or I can't think of other of other sitcoms because I don't want. Well, or, or yeah, not because I don't watch. Them. It's like I don't have time to watch. So I guess that's the best way to put it. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm falling into the trap too. So um, you're smart. So you'll you'll enjoy you know The Office as well and Parks and Recreation um, and, and Thirty Rock as well. It is dependent again, and we've talked about this numerous times that taste is not neutral either, and it's kind of central to this whole sort of endeavor and enterprise. But on 199, right? To go back um, to this, right? This is the first few lines. Disney ABC uses these kinds of interstitials to reinforce Disney's desired framing of the film and of itself as a conglomerate committed to diversity, right? So they use the extra content, right? to kind of enforce the, the, the party line, right, the official reading of the film, and also simultaneously to kind of um, promote themselves, self-promotion. Okay, these are finally done. Um, of a conglomerate, right, Diver devoted to diversity, right. Um, but again, if there's only one way to read the film, that's not very diverse, right? Um, and that becomes the question, right? Why? Why, why are they so committed to um, uh, promoting themselves as uh, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, committed to diversity? Now, I will say very clear, like, one should be committed to diversity, but does that mean that they actually are? Uh, is Disney, you know, committed to diversity? And more importantly, why are they so committed? Are they committed to it? Are they committed to promoting themselves as committed to it? That is an important question. Okay, uh, rounding uh, the corner into the final stretch. Here we go.